whether you're joining us uh, with your morning coffee, mid-afternoon snack, or perhaps a late uh, night cup of tea, welcome to our webinar. Meet the engineers, uh, a unique wavefront expertise to address optical metrology challenges of ESA's Euclid mission. My name is uh, Omar Kobeiter, and I'm the digital marketing uh, manager at Imagine Optic, a company specialized in development of wavefront sensing optical metrology, adaptive optic solutions, and custom developments based on engineering and optics, mechanics, and uh, software development. I'm thrilled to have you all here today as we dive into the fascinating world of uh, astronomy and optics. Uh, we have an exciting lineup of speakers who are experts in the field and have uh, made significant contributions for both scientific uh, research and a practical application in astronomy. Uh, our first speaker is Jean-Luc Dauvergne. Jean-Luc is a section editor for Ciel et Espace magazine, published by the Association Française d'Astronomie. He specializes in observation techniques and brings a wealth of knowledge and experience in the field of astronomy. We're delighted to have him with us today. Uh, next, we have Guillaume Dovillère, the CTO at Imagine Optic. Guillaume is an expert in wavefront sensing metrology and adaptive optics. He has contributed to the development of numerous test beds for space missions such as Euclid, Herschel, uh, Gaia, Corot, and Teleo and is also an amateur astronomer by night. Uh, his dual perspective as both a professional and an enthusiast make his insights particularly valuable. Uh, our third speaker is Benoit Sassolas, researcher engineer at the LMA ip 2 z platform, a CNS research unit. Benoit has played a key role in the development of uh, large mirrors for the second generation gravitational wave detectors like Advanced LIGO, Advanced Virgo, and Kagra. He has also worked on the Fabry Parrot Etalon for the DKIS telescope and large decroic plates for PFS and for most instruments. Benoit is also the co chair of uh, the core optics work package for the Einstein Telescope project, which is the European project for a third generation uh, gravitational wave detector. Uh, following will be the agenda of this meeting. And before we get started, uh, a few housekeeping items. Please feel free to submit your questions throughout the webinar using the Q&A feature at the upper right of the uh, GoToWebinar, where you see the question mark and the conversation. And during the live demo of Benoit, you can double click on the dedicated screen uh, to make it a bit bigger, uh, so you will be able to see more what is uh, shared. So without uh, further ado, let's get started. Our first speaker will be Jean-Luc. Uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Omar. It's a pleasure to be with you this afternoon. So I'm gonna talk about Euclid to introduce uh, this telescope. Um, yes, I take the control to split the screen. So as you probably already know, Euclid is a space telescope operated by the European Space Agency. And uh, stay tuned up to the end of this presentation because uh, I have a small surprise at the end of something you have not seen before, I guess. <laughs> so a few words about Euclid. It's a one dot two meter telescope with a core design that is similar to the James Webb Space Telescope. It's a good configuration, configuration to avoid scattered lights. And it's a quite clever design because it has only two instruments, but is, this telescope is able to do a lot of strong field things in science. So there is an instrument named VIS that is dedicated to the visible part of the spectrum and another one that is NISM that is more in the infrared part of the spectrum. And the main characteristic of this telescope is to have a very wide field. In fact, it has one half the resolution of the Hubble Space Telescope, that's a lot, but the field of view is very wide. It's 270 
65 times the field of view of the Hubble Space Telescope. So as you can see on these images, uh, on the left you have the field of view of a clid that is bigger than the apparent size of the moon. And if you compare it on the right to the field of view of the wide field planetary camera three of the Hubble Space Telescope, that is not that small for a big telescope as Hubble, but uh, in fact, it's much smaller than the apparent side of the moon. So this very wide field allows to do a lot of more science on galaxies than Hubble does. You probably know that Hubble's made some very deep field observation of the universe of galaxies. It shows a very, a very profound image of uh, the galaxy but at the end we don't know if uh, the universe is the same in all the direction or if it's uh, just a particular part of the sky so euclid will make we is going to make this work to 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 see to make what Hubble did but on all the sky nearly all the sky so here we have a view of the backside of the telescope. So we see the two instruments and uh, a quite complex uh, path of the light. It's not so complex in fact, but uh, if you see the picture like that, you don't really understand what is happening. <laughs> but in fact, the light is coming so from the hole that is at the center of the primary mirror, the main mirror. It goes on one mirror, two mirror, a third mirror. And then it, go, it goes on a, an important device that is a dichroic glass. And uh, Guillaume will, will discuss a lot about this particular optical element uh, after. So this dichroic glass is able to split the light between the visible part of the spectrum and the infrared part of the spectrum. So the infrared light goes through the glass so the instrument is here, and then the visible part is reflected on the, an over mirror, and then it goes on the instrument. So at the end, it's a telescope that is quite simple compared to what you can have on a VLT, for instance, with a very complex instrument. Here, it's quite simple, and uh, it's able to do a, a great, uh, great science. <laughs> So the visible part of the instrument is made of um, 36 CCD and it covers a field of uh, 600 million pixels. So it produces very huge images. And uh, you have to have in mind that you have 600 million pixels with half the revolution, resolution of the Hubble Space Telescope. So it makes precise measurement and it makes also a very huge set of data. <laughs> the infrared instrument, NISP, is have a smaller resolution of 65 million pixels. So the pixels are bigger and uh, it makes a different kind of sci a different type of science. In fact, with these, you mainly have some image with a very good resolution. And with NISP, the instruments mainly do some uh, photometry. In fact, NISP is, do is um, dotted with a, a set of filters that, that allow the scientists to have a measurement of the distance of the galaxy, uh, a simple measurement of the distance of the galaxy. And the instrument also has some prism. So here you can see a sample of images. On the left, we have these. On the middle, the image taken with NISP. And on the right, it's also NISP. But on the filter wheel, you can put one of the filters. And you also have some prisms that allow to do some spectrum of the galaxies. And the clever part is that, in fact, there is not only one prism, there is a second one, a second prism. And like that, scientists are able to have the spectrum of the galaxy under two different angles. 
and that allow to to extract each spectrum of galaxy very precisely. Of course, if you consider only just one image, you have the spectrum of some galaxy that are over the spectrum of other galaxy. But if you have the, the spectrum under two different angles, it's possible to extract exactly the spectrum of each galaxy. And like this, scientists may have the the redshift of the galaxy that gives you the distance of the galaxy. So here is an example of the picture realized with the infrared instrument. They took different filters and this, with this filter they are able to to produce a color image of the skies. And when you look at such an image, you can see that some galaxies are quite um, white, we can say. Other are yellow, yellowish, and other ones are reddish. And just by looking the color of the galaxy, you have a first indication of the distance of the galaxy. The white galaxy is close to us. The yellow one is farther, and the red one is very far in the universe. It's not a very precise measurement, but it allows scientists to go very deep in the universe. And as you know, if you go very deep in distance, you'll, you also go very deep in the past. So as I said before, Euclid is going to produce a very huge amount of data. It will observe all the skies, but some part of the skies have, have some kind of light pollution, we can say. <laughs> when light pollution is the light of the Milky Way, so it will avoid this central part with the Milky Way and another source of light pollution to this kind of very deep measurement is the solar system. In fact, around the sun, there is a disk of dust and it reflects the light of the sun. So Euclid will also avoid this part that is the plane of the ecliptic. But it has to observe all the rest of the skies and it will make a very huge amount of data. In fact, it will produce 170,000 tetrabytes of data, that's huge. In fact, if you store it on classical one terabyte hard drive, if you would stack all these hard drives, the one over the other, it will make a tower of uh, more than two kilometer height. <laughs> so you have to imagine that it's, uh, of course, uh, a challenge to store all this data to send it back to the Earth. And of course, the main challenge is to process such a very big amount of data because uh, in fact, it will not be made by the, the end of man. It have, to be, it have to be done with computer automatically. And uh, so they have to make some algorithm able to, to, to manage this very huge amount of data. So to understand, in fact, the two challenges, the two questions that Euclid is going to ask is to understand how is, uh, for what is the dark matter in the universe? As you know, most of the mat matter in the universe is not uh, visible and you can detect this dark matter by uh, looking at deformation in the space. And you know, if you have a, a big amount of matter, uh, of mass somewhere in the universe, it will make a deformation of the space. So what consider Euclid is that uh, if you take an average galaxy, it has an elliptical shape. In fact, it's not true, as you may know, some galaxy has, has an irregular shape. But if you consider it from a statistical point of view, in fact, you can consider that every galaxy has an elliptical shape. And what Euclid is able to do is to detect some very small deformation in this elliptical shape. Even it's, it's able to detect some deformation of 1% in this shape. That means that if you look at a 
uh, a picture took by Euclid, you will see some galaxy. Most of them will look um, familiar to you with a classical shape, and you will not be able to detect this deformation with your naked eye, but with some algorithm, it's possible to detect this deformation. So with this very precise image made with the visible channel of Euclid, they will make this detection of deformation. And then with the filter set of the infrared instrument, they have an indication of the, of the position of the galaxy. So they will be able to make a global map of the dark matter in the universe. And they hope that with this global map, they will be able to have a better understanding of what could be this dark, dark matter. Up to today, no one had uh, any idea of what it is. And the other enigma for scientists is uh, the dark energy. <laughs> uh, since uh, about uh, 25 years, we have discovered that the expansion of the universe is speeding up. We don't, mm, we don't know why, but we have to introduce in the equation some, uh, some things that is a, a dark energy, an energy that we don't know. And to probe this dark energy, one solution is to, to find, to measure the baryonic acoustic os oscillation of the universe. In fact, in fact, it's some oscillation that happened at the very beginning of the universe. Today, it's very hard to see this oscillation of the universe, but there is one way to, to probe this oscillation is to measure the collection function. It's in fact, if you take the definition given by James Peeble, the Nobel Prize, it says that uh, given a random galaxy in a location, the correlation function describes the probability that another galaxy will be found within a given distance. So to say it shortly, the correlation function is a typical distance you can see between two galaxies. So Euclid will look at this at different time in the past of the universe to see if it changed over the time. And it will maybe give a better understanding of what this dark energy could be. Thank you so much, Jean-Luc. Uh, your, your presentation was amazing. Uh, I hope that everyone here appreciate this uh, uh, very detailed introduction about a clean telescope and uh, a clean uh, mission. Yes, uh, uh, as you say, Jean-Luc, I will focus on one specific item that you uh, introduced. Let me show you again this uh, back focal plane of the Euclid telescope. Uh, I won't follow the beam as you perfectly did before, but just want to focus on this one here. This is the dichroic mirror. So uh, yes, it is. This is the picture of this dichroic mirror, and uh, as you as you said, uh, it splits the light into two uh, different beam: one for visible, which is reflected, and one for infrared, which is transmitted by uh, this device. Uh, this mirror has a diameter of 120 millimeter. Uh, it has been uh, designed and uh, manufactured by a German company, OBJ. Um, and it is now, for, of course, uh, introduced in the telescope uh, on flight. So even before the telescope alignment, uh, when OBJ uh, did the first test, they saw some very strange chromatic effects uh, on the reflected beam. Um, and they, they confirmed that uh, this uh, effect comes from the dark mirror. In fact, what they observed is that the reflective wavefront depends on the wavelengths, which is not obvious for what should be a mirror. And uh, due to uh, the, 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 the mission and the planning, uh, ESA decided to integrate in the telescope one of the two manufactured Dichroic mirror and use a flight spare to fully characterize this effect. 
the idea is to uh, post process all the data Jean Le Cretre used in order to take into account the defect of this uh, direct mirror to get and to access the uh, scientific results. So in the context of this observation, uh, ESA uh, decided in uh, three, three years ago now to uh, start a very big activity around this dichroic flight spare uh, model. Uh, and they decided to purchase a test bed in order to fully characterize this chromatic effect. And that we did. Um, so we create this uh, name, OBSERVE. It stands for Optical Bench for Spectrally Resolved Wavefront Measurement of the Euclid Decrite Mirror. Uh, here are four um, very important specifications on this, of this bench. Uh, the first one is that the measurement of the reflected wavefront must be done from 520 to 950 nanometer for all polarization states for zero degree incidence on the mirror and from 4 to 20 with the accuracy of one nanometer root mean square. Accuracy means the real shape of the Euclid mirror. It's not relatively to uh, something else. It's the absolute measurement of the Euclid uh, dichroic uh, mirror. And this is very challenging. Uh, we accept the challenge and uh, did something. So what we chose, uh, it was, I think, two years ago when we do the, the preliminary design, uh, the bench includes two sources uh, the first one is a super companion laser, so a white laser with four gratings monochromator. And this light is injected in a large mode area fiber. So it, this specific fiber allows to have a single mode uh, within a very large spectral range. And this laser is able to uh, start from 500 nan nanometer to one micron with a spectral bandwidth of 0.3 nanometer full width half maximum which is what was specified by ESA. And in order to uh, have a reference wavelengths on the bench, uh, we also use, uh, a, let's say, uh, a HINI, but not the standard wavelengths of a HINI, a 594.1 nanometer HINI. And it provides us a very stable and known wavelengths and a reference for the tilt. Because what I didn't say is that the one nanometer uh, expected uh, accuracy include the tilt uh, in compared to uh, reference wavelengths. Um, of course, uh, we have the sources. We need to have a wavefront sensor, so we decided to use a Shackatman wavefront sensor. We are specialists here at Imagine Optic of these kind of sensors. We designed 48 by 48 micro lenses on a 10 by 10 millimeter aperture. And you can see here what is the accuracy of this sensor and the repeatability of this sensor are using one single image without uh, averaging. Um, keep in mind that a Shackerton sensor is something that is quite simple. You just have a micro lens array and a detector behind. You just calculate the spot position. When you try to do this kind of, uh, to reach this kind of accuracy, it's very, very complicated. Uh, I added here for you uh, the effect of the wavelengths. Uh, it's, uh, it comes from some images we acquired here at Imagine Optics. So on the left, you have 550, and on the right, 950. It shows that the micro lenses create a diffraction limited spot on the detector. And the idea of the Shackerton sensor is to calculate the position of all these spots. And we uh, designed an optical bench. Uh, this bench is like this. Uh, here is a picture. You'll, uh, Benoit you, will show you uh, on live uh, this, uh, this bench uh, in, in very large detail later. Uh, here we start from the source point here. I hope you can see my, my pointing here. Start from here from the bottom of this, uh, of this ZMAX drawing. As you see, the, it was complex. It goes uh, on flat mirrors. It goes on spherical mirror. 
the dichroic mirror is in red here and then it is reflected and enters it to, into another beam expand beam reducer and it goes to uh, the diagnostic bench which includes the wavefront sensor I presented before, but also a pupil imaging camera and a point spread function camera. And the incidence can be changed by rotating this mirror here and rotating this mirror here and translating on the long rail here. With, it allows you to change the inf incidence uh, on the dac range. In order to measure at zero degree, what we do is that we use the same bottom part of the bench, but set the dichroic in autocollimation in order to come back to the same beam expander and what we call the uh, diagnostic uh, bench is transferred from a post to another one and we use the same diagnostic bench in order to measure the reflected beam on the dichroic at zero degree incidence. You have also here a zoom on what happened on this diagnostic part. You have on the first reflected mirror, the wavefront sensor, then it goes through and enters the pupil imaging camera. And then we have the punch pipe function camera at the end. So, uh, yeah. So what you'll see now is some preliminary measurement we did on the Euclid uh, dichroic mirror. So what you'll see is that here there is uh, uh, something which show you the wavelengths. Here there is a plot. The wavelength is uh, on the x-axis and on the y you have the root mean square wavefront error in nanometer. And we did uh, preliminary results at zero degree incidence, it's the left part. At 19 degree, with the same polarization, P. And also on the right, 19 degree, but polarization S. Let's sh show you what happened. So you see here now the film is starting. I hope you can see the wavelength scanning. And on, you can, it's not very continuous, but you can see peaks here that is, are clearly visible and bumps something move on the reflected wavefront maps. Let's go up to the end of this movie and you see that there are very strange bumps in the root mean square wavefront error that is reflected by the dichroic depending on the wavelengths. And in white, you have zero degree, 19 degree in red, so you can clearly see the shift in wavelengths and also the polarization S change a bit the shift uh, in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the wavelength. So these are preliminary data. As you see, some points are missing in the middle, 730, because we have photometry issues here. Uh, but what is very interesting to have a look on is the scale. Here, starting from 15 to 20 nanometers, which is quite a good quality for a reflected wavefront error, it goes up to 40, 45 nanometers, which is not negligible. So it creates a change on the punch rate function and it reduces the quality of the telescope. So if we go a bit further in the analysis, uh, we can analyze in terms of Zernike coefficient, what happened? Again, on x-axis, the wavelengths and the Zernike focus coefficient now, you can clearly see for two uh, polarization states, all the bumps that are clearly visible on the focus term. I extracted also the spherical aberration terms. You have also this bump and the coma. Here, the comma is the other sign, but so this bump. If you remember well, uh, Jean-Luc presented that the main purpose of Euclid is to measure, to measure very precisely the shape of uh, galaxies. You probably know that if you have curvature or spherical aberration, it does not change the shape of the galaxy, but coma does. And this is frightening for the scientific point of view, because if you create coma that depends on the wavelengths, it means that you'll have clearly errors on the scientific data that will be calculated 
from the raw images if you do not take into account this effect. And a very small analysis of what happened on this, uh, on this substrate is this. So I'm really not a specialized on this, uh, a specialist on this, but clearly what happened is that on the uh, dichroic substrate, uh, there is, I think, 180 layers in order to create the dichroic function. But if you consider an inhomogeneity of a layer in, uh, in the diameter of the uh, dichroic, at the end, this inhomogeneity in thickness will create this phase effect in function of the wavelengths. If you uh, need some more information, I just I wrote here the reference paper that has been uh, written uh, by Maël Baron and Benoit, who will uh, now uh, take the microphone and uh, present uh, the bench. Benoit, are you ready? Yes. Thank you, Guillaume. So, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. So, uh... Welcome uh, at LMA. Uh, so uh, uh, I'm uh, in live from the, the clean room. So uh, uh, I hope that the background noise is not so uh, annoying. So um, as Omar said uh, at LMA, we are mainly uh, uh, focused on the development of uh, coating for large mirrors, such as the gravitational wave mirrors or the optics for telescope. And since uh, 2018, we are part of the of the effort for the characterization of the dichroic uh, mirror of Euclid. So I am going to, to give you uh, a tour of the, of the bench uh, in live. So uh, I hope uh, that everything will, uh, will work. Uh, OK, so let's, uh, let's start with the uh, light source. So I recommend that you double, double click on my uh, picture in order to have a, a big uh, a big window. Okay, so uh, you can see here in the red, the, this red uh, block is a, a supercontinuum uh, light source that provides uh, the light uh, uh, over the useful uh, wavelength range. And this uh, this uh, uh, light source is uh, coupled with uh, coupled with a monochromator right here in order to uh, to control precisely the, the selected wavelength with a very high accuracy and a high resolution. And then uh, we have uh, at the bottom a yellow, uh, a yellow uh, large uh, mode apert uh, area fiber that, uh, that brings uh, the light towards the, the observed bench. So we are in the technical control room of the, of the bench. Uh, so we, we are moving to the, the bench. Okay. So the yellow fiber arises from the wall right, uh, right here and then arrives to the uh, source block here. So you can see the, the yellow fiber. OK. And there is also uh, another source, the reference source, right here, an alien neon at uh, 594 nanometers, going to the, uh, to the uh, source block uh, thanks to this uh, folding mirror and the periscope right here. And then here on the source block, there, there are two very uh, important uh, uh, sy systems, the ultra fast sh shutters that, uh, that enable to, to switch very quickly between uh, both uh, wavelengths, the reference wavelength and the useful wavelength. And we are able in, we, in this way to, uh, to measure uh, the wavefront at both wavelengths in very short, uh, in very short uh, time, in order to freeze uh, all the uh, air turbulence along the optical path. Okay, so the, the two uh, shutters are here, and there you can see a small bin splitter, and that uh, that puts the, the both wavelengths on the same uh, optical path and then uh, diff diffraction uh, all in order to clean and to, uh, to act as a punctual uh, source. A folding mirror right here, and then the light is 
uh, arrives we, uh, to the uh, polarizer right here. And with this uh, polarizer, we are able to control the polarization of the incident, uh, uh, incident uh, light uh, at uh, any uh, polarization uh, state. At this, uh, at this stage, uh, the output of the polarizer, the light uh, has a diameter of 10 millimeters. And as uh, Guillaume said, uh, there is a, a beam uh, 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 a beam expander in order to uh, to to increase uh, the the diameter of the uh, of the beam up to uh, 120 uh, millimeter in order to to uh, to match the diameter of the of the dike wick. So you can see uh, some uh, optics uh, right here of the beam expander. And so and then uh, we arrive to the um, what we call the, the trombone. Yeah. Okay. So the trombone is a, a two mirrors system, this one and this one. Uh, so this system is able to, to control the angle of incidence onto the, the, the back wake mirror. And we can align uh, easily the, the bench. And then the light arrives to the deck wick mirror. So you can see uh, the uh, flight spare installed on the bench. So it is uh, this, uh, this yellowish uh, mirror in the solder. And then uh, we uh, collect the repeated uh, light thanks to the beam reducer. So the first mirror is uh, here. And this beam reducer uh, decreases uh, decrease, uh, the, the beam, beam size uh, down to uh, 10 millimeters. And arrive, the light arrives to uh, what we call the uh, diagnostic, uh, diagnostic block. So this big, uh, uh, big, big, part, big, big system. So in this, uh, in this, uh, uh, Diagnostic block. So there are a lot of uh, bad things. So we, we can not see a lot of things, but uh, there, there are several beam splitters in order to split the, the light uh, towards uh, uh, each uh, diagnostic uh, channel. So uh, there are actually uh, three, um, three channels: uh, a wavefront uh, error channel, uh, an intensity uh, channel, and a, a PSF channel. So the wavefront uh, channel is here with this uh, the custom uh, uh, Sharkman sensor uh, developed by uh, Blade Imaging Optic. The camera for the intensity uh, measurement is here, and the uh, camera for the PSF uh, measurement is here. Okay, and all all this system is uh, uh, controlled uh, thanks to a dedicated uh, software. So. We go back to the control room. Uh, okay. So I will give you uh, okay. Okay, so uh, you can see uh, on, the, on the screen the uh, control software for the uh, acquisition and the alignment of the uh, of the bench. So we can uh, control every uh, uh, not every but a lot of uh, uh, components on the on the bench. So the the alignment of the mirrors and the uh, parameters uh, of the shark Hartman sensor, for example. You can see uh, in this uh, image on the bottom uh, left, uh, the, um, the spot, uh, the spot uh, image uh, measured by the uh, shark Hartman uh, sensor. We can see uh, so you can see uh, the spot. Uh, here, okay, 
and we can see also in live the, the wave front uh, figure error. So right here. So uh, as you can uh, see here, the image is cropped. So that means that the the bench is poorly aligned, uh, and we can, uh, uh, thanks to this software, uh, align uh, remotely the, the bench. So uh, I'm acting on uh, one mirror of the trombone in order to align. Yes, and uh, we yeah, we retrieve uh, the the few PPA of the of the dike wake. So this uh, software uh, enables a lot of operation, uh, but uh, we uh, at the end we uh, we, uh, we we get only the uh, raw wave front uh, uh, maps, and uh, we need uh, after uh, afterwards to to process these images in order to uh, correct some uh, distortion because of the uh, optical uh, optical bench and uh, to to average several measurements and, and so on. So there is, there is another uh, processing software developed also by uh, by Imagenetic. And at the end, we uh, we get the the, the real uh, wave of the of the dark week. And uh, at every uh, angle of incidence, uh, polarization state and uh, angle uh, wavelength, we uh, we want it. Yep. So that's it for the for this short tour. Thank you so much, Benoit, for this uh, great tour. And thank you, Guillaume and Jean-Luc, for this great presentation. Uh, our presentation is over. We'll be open for all your questions. So do not hesitate to click on the question mark on the upper uh, right side of this uh, of GoToWebinar. We'll wait a couple of minutes to be able to answer your questions. <laughs>